Open your Bibles to the book of Romans, 8th chapter. <clears throat> this will probably be my last study out of uh, the Roman creation. Um, but tonight we're looking at 23 through, um, we've studied this once before, but I'm going to do a study from it. Uh, 8, 23 through 25. Now you remember, the key to this passage, as far as uh, key markers, is the word groan. And at the word groan divides this, um, our, our major passage, which is Romans 8, 18 through 27. The word groan divides it in three sections. 18 through 22 talks about groaning of creation. Uh, 23 through 25 talks about the groaning in, uh, in the Christian, uh, in the body. And then uh, verses 26, 27 talks about the groaning of the Holy Spirit who is in, inside the believer's body, right? So <clears throat> that becomes a good marker to divide our passage down and discuss it. Now, <clears throat> when you're talking about creation, like up in verses when you're looking at verses 18 through 22 for a moment, <clears throat> and he's talking about uh, at the present time, the, the creation, when you read through verses, uh, through, through verse uh, 21, you'll see that the groaning of the creation, uh, verse 20, it's because it's subjected to futility, uh, because it's connected with the curse associated with Adam's sin. That is the curse of Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Cursed is the ground, thorns and thistles business. In verse uh, uh, 20, it says, for the creation was subjected. Verse 21, for the creation itself also. Now, so creation, creation is the subject matter. Now look at verse 18, because what he's going to talk about is the present suffering, and he's going to talk about creation, the Christian, and the Holy Spirit. He says, the present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. That's church-age believers. So the groaning of the creation here in this discussion is going to groan until something called uh, revealed uh, the glory to be revealed to the church age believer. Then in verse 19 talks about the anxious longing of the creation waiting eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. <coughs> the creation, you know, discussed in Genesis day one, day two, day three, up through six is groaning due to the curse placed on it in association with Adam's sin. And it will remain that way until what, what, what is whatever the glory that is to be revealed to the church age believer, um, the revealing of the sons of God, um, and the earth in verse 20 says it is in, uh, a groaning travail pain type of situation um, in verse 20 uh, in hope in hope now when you're talking about the creation the earth and things like that he's talking in language of accommodation right says so, so, a way for us to understand it when, when it comes to our time to, that the creation itself also Watch in verse 21, the creation will be set free from its slavery to corruption. That is the curse associated with Adam's sin in Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Will, will be set free, set free, set free, set free. Okay? You can do all you want with climate change and all that, but here's where it comes. Set free from a slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So the creation is in groaning since Adam's sin. That's the Garden of Eden story. All the way through human history, all the way out until, listen, all the way out to the second coming of Christ until what is revealed from us is our resurrection. When the church 
gets its resurrection body called the rapture, then the earth will be removed. Temporarily, they'll go through some changes and the millennial deal will come up and then it will go into the, the final stages. Uh, but it's based on the resurrection. It is the earth is going to be in travail of pain due to the curse of Adam's sin, right? The curse part. Until the order of the resurrection is completed. If you want to know about the order of the, of the, of the resurrection, then you read 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. And what you find is that there is a resurrection going to occur at the end of each dispensation. At the end of the church age, at the end of the Jewish age, at the end of the millennial age. And when that's completed, the earth, earth will be set free from its curse. All right? So that's, that's one of the factors that, that we have learned from that. And so our subject matter tonight, so when we get to verse 23, 24, where our subject comes from, now he talks about the groaning of the body of the, of the believer in verse 23. <clears throat> Look at verse 22. It says, we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth until now. Okay? To the coming of Christ, <coughs> the, the millennial age, and then things are going to change. Now, the earth isn't, but the conditions now, with the coming of Christ, the whole situation, we're now in the last days period of this whole business. Verse 23, not only this, but also we, in other words, everything we said from 18 through 22, talking about creation, is ditto. Uh, not only this, but we, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, Watch this, how he's going to use ourselves and our, ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. That's the resurrection. Notice how he describes it. You know how he describes it? Listen to this. The final stage of redemption is our resurrection. How about that? Well, you better be in that resurrection. Uh, and to be there, you're going to have to be in the redemption. It is the redemption. Now, is there, on the front end, salvation is redemption of her soul. On the back end, redemption of her body. You understand that? That's the front and the back end of this thing. So... The redemption of our body. For in hope, that's confident expectations. Not I hope, I hope. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is not is that that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. And so this whole deal of creation groaning, the Christian's body in this body, we are in corruption a corruption state of our body. And that won't be any different for anybody that goes through this period until receives a new body. And so we're talking about that tonight. This is our subject matter tonight, the redemption of our body that comes out of this specific text. And that's a, now here's another thing. We look for markers when we're studying the Bible and we find passages, we're looking for markers in the, Section on the, on the um, creation, there's a marker. In verse 18, it's the word glory. The, the suffering that we're going through in our present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. Right? And again, he's going to talk about the word glory in verse 21. And, and, and he's going to carry this, this concept of uh, waiting, and then he's going to connect waiting eagerly with it. So the word glory in verse 18, actually, if you notice, we said this once before, but verse 
when verse 18 opens up the word for. So verse 17 is important. It says, if children, then heirs, heirs of God, if you're saved, you're a child of God, an heir, a joint heir with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. So the idea is established and the word glorified in 17 is discussed as glory and that subject pushes all the way through the passage that we've been looking at, chapter 8, verses 18 through 27. Okay? Glory, therefore, glory is going to be one of the two markers important to our lesson tonight. The redemption of her body. It is used in verse 17 as an introduction. It is then used again in verse 18 and 21. The second marker that we're going to look for that's going to be important to our study is the word eagerly waiting. Now, we've discussed this word before because we're at the end of this period of study. Waiting eagerly for what? I mean, he's used this word over and over again as a key thing. And you go like, waiting eagerly for what? And so the last time he uses it, he uses it three times, 19, 23, and 25. Waiting eagerly. And then he finally tells us we're waiting eagerly for the redemption of our body. Uh, Paul talks this way in 1 Corinthians 1, 7 when he says, waiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if you're waiting eagerly for it or not. But I can tell you who is. Those people who are suffering in the body. And if you've known people like that, then you know what I'm talking about. They're waiting. They're, this is not going to change apart from a miracle. And therefore, they have to wait eagerly for hope and the hope of the resurrection. You know, maybe that's, maybe that's what caused so many of the early church because of their great persecution to say, uh, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Because of the extreme uh, suffering they were going through. Now, this is, not, this is suffering for Christ's sake, not for your sake. Okay. And so that, that's important. So we, we've got two words we're going to keep. We're going to keep a tab on waiting eagerly. Listen, creation is waiting eagerly. Just like we're waiting eagerly. It's just kind of interesting how he tied the two together. We are waiting eagerly. Like I said, if you're if you're really healthy, you probably don't think about it. But this waiting eagerly is for the, the coming of the Lord. And you shouldn't have to be in terrible shape or conditions in your life to wait eagerly for the coming of the Lord, should we? Uh, so, I'm just, I'm just, this is how Paul laid this out. Now, I'm going to talk about four ideas tonight about the redemption of our body. <clears throat> We're told that the whole creation point, have I had a word of prayer? I don't think so. I thought, my engine started getting wild up. Then I thought, hmm. Well, let's open with a word of prayer. Let me stop and have a word of prayer. Apparently, I need it, and you do too, so. Classroom etiquette for those who are visiting with us on the Internet. <coughs> the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't study it, nor can you live it in the flesh. Carnality. Evidence of carnality would be personal sin. Personal sin under First John, the order of First John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sin, that could be mental attitude sins or sins of the tongue or overt sins. If you confess your sins, he is faithful. He is just to forgive you and cleanse you. That cleansing restores you to fellowship. Under the ministry of the Holy Spirit now, he is able to teach you tonight the word of God. You can learn it under his power. You can live it under his power. That's the only way. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. So I give you in a moment to confess your sin and silence through your priesthood. Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way both by automobile and Internet. And we pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. We pray that people would find some inner discipline in their life to be able to concentrate, not let their mind wander. 
not be distracted, but stay focused as the Holy Spirit teaches them a relevant truth for their life that's important for them today and tomorrow. Maybe even clean up some past that they're still dragging around that needs to be taken care of. So we pray the Holy Spirit minister the truth of the word of God into our souls tonight through this study, the redemption of our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Point number one, the whole creation, we've learned, waits eagerly for the redemption of our body. It's not waiting eagerly for theirs. It's waiting eagerly for ours. Because it ain't going to happen until ours happen. <laughs> See? It's funny how we're attached to the earth and that earth is attached to us. We came from the earth. We live on it. We, we die and go back to it. But the earth is held as much captive to us as we are to the earth. So says Paul, which is kind of an interesting idea, isn't it? <clears throat> Being a farmer myself, I really understood that. But anyhow, you know. in 823, it says, and not only this, referring back to 18, 19, 21, 23, 25, key passages, not only this, but also we, church age believer, that's the CAB, church age believer, ourselves, having the first fruit of the Spirit, that's being born again, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And here's another idea. <laughs> adoption, which you get at the point of salvation, in Romans 8 chapter verses 15 through 17. The final, which you get at salvation, the final stage of it is when you get your resurrection body. So you see what Paul is talking about here in the 50 things that you receive at salvation, you can never lose in time and eternity. Do you understand that? Paul was very clear that this is absolutely security. Do you understand that? He talks about redemption here. The final stage of it is your resurrection. Adoption here, final stage is over here. See that? I mean, he certainly believed in it. But he didn't. And, and um, in this, also, when it talks about the sealing, for example, in, in Ephesians, I wrote on your paper, but in Ephesians 4.30, listen to what Paul writes uh, in that in that passage, uh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God for whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, here's the sealing that happens at salvation that's got to hold you and carry you all the way to the day of redemption. You understand? And where do you get the sealing from? Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 says that the Holy Spirit is with the believer inside him forever. Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, 13, 14 on your paper is where it discusses the sealing at the point of salvation. The sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit is one of eight works of the Holy Spirit at salvation that you can never lose in time and eternity. You say to me, well, Ron, where do you get this idea of time and eternity for those who are visiting with us on the Internet? From the Word of God. In the book of Ephesians, in the first chapter, 1, 13 and 14, you are sealed at the point of salvation. In the fourth chapter, verse 30, that sealing takes me all the way to the resurrection. That's where I got it. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like I was paused in deep thought one night and a, a bird from paradise came down. And I mean, it, I just discovered by studying Paul, Paul kept knocking it out, knocking it out, knocking it out. And I go like, geez, how could you miss this? He certainly believed it, right? I mean, is there no evidence of that from Paul's teaching? Of course, there. I mean, there's plenty of evidence of it. And so, look, 
we've got three words in this. We've got three words that are really important to you. Redemption, adoption, and sealing. And you know what they are? They're key words. Listen, here's redemption. If you, if you pick up our little booklet, 50 Things That You Can Never Lose Diamond, or, or on the internet, you just go to our website, and you can put, pick down, look for the 50 things, you will see that there are, our redemption is part of the nine communion factors of the blood of Christ that's, that you should be aware of when you take part in the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, communion, however you want to discuss it. Redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, justification, peace with God, right? That whole list. See, redemption, redemption. So he talks about redemption, that once you enter redemption, you never leave redemption until redemption of your body. You understand that? It's, there it is. That's your time on earth. That's your lockup. Then he uses the word adoption. Same thing. He uses the word sealing, same way. Do you understand that? So when you talk about redemption, you're talking about the nine, the nine communion factors of the blood of Christ. When you're talking about sealing, you're talking about the eight works of the Holy Spirit. When you're talking about adoption, you're talking about the 20 status privileges. That's all the positive side of the 50 things. The only thing that he, you don't have here that you have earlier in the book of Romans is the 13 judicial charges that you're under before you get saved in Christ. You know, alienated, blind, you know, cursed, condemned, death, you know, all that. It's just interesting how Paul lays that out there. If you study Paul, then you know what he's talking about. But he used three key ideas in this. He used three key ideas that cover the 37 things in the 50 things, the 37 things that are positive, that these are the 50 things you get you can never lose in time and eternity. You get 13 removed from you that are done kaput. Something like that. All right, the second thing. I'm just telling you what Paul is telling us. That's all I'm doing. I'm just explaining what Paul explained to us. The second thing is in Romans 8.23, in Romans 8, 23, Paul is saying that the resurrection of the church age believer called glorification, it's called glorification, glorification. Look, and let me show it to you in Romans. You're in you're Romans 8, right? Let's go down to, let's go down to 29. I'll show it to you again here. Let me show it to you. Uh, let's go to, what do I have here? 30, I'm looking for 29 through 30 or something like that. Oh, no wonder I couldn't find it. I was in chapter 10. Eight, uh, chapter 8, I went, boy, that don't look right. Uh, look, listen, listen, here's 40, 49. Uh, it, uh, not 49. My... I'm having a senior moment here. <clears throat> verse 28. Look at verse 28. Look at the word called. That's important. Now, everybody knows that 28. You know, all things work together for good. Uh, well, to those who love God, to those, notice the word to those, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, to his divine plan. That's the plan that came out of eternity past that works for us. Are you with me? Now, pay attention to the word called. Now, here's what he says. And that word called is important now. Here's what he says. Because, be, listen, verse 28 is the dynamics of the Christian life, right? I mean, we're living it out. All things work together for good. I mean, how many times do we pull that baby up? I mean, that's a Christian life in the dynamics of living uh, trying to, trying, struggling to live for Christ in the devil's world. And he's, and twice he used this word, to those who are called, to those who are in a love relationship. Now, in verse 29, he says, now watch what he says. He says, and watch for the five, watch for five things. He says, for whom, that to those, right, 
to the two to those? Come on now. For whom? For whom? Say, we're connected to the to whom? To those, to those, to whom? For whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, of whom he predestined. Now we're back to predestined. Say, foreknown and predestined. Now we're back to that. He predestined. These he called. See? We, that's that tag in verse 28. We're living out that redeemed life as a called, which is one of the 50 status privileges, called, and whom he called, these he justified, and who he justified, he glorified. Do you see the five things? That's a given. See that glorified? That's what we're talking about here. That believer that's struggling, uh, living for Christ, the struggles that's going on, to put your life out there in the devil's world and live for Christ, and you're suffering for living for Christ? All things are working good for your life. God has a master plan, and you're part of it. You are part of it. The day that you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you became a significant part in the heart of God in his divine plan that came out of eternity past. Listen, I don't, listen, don't let, let the devil keep telling you that, that you're not important, that you're a nobody. You've screwed up your life. There's no hope for you. Listen, the one thing there is for you is hope in Christ. And I don't mean hope to get better. I mean confident expectation that God can change your life dramatically. You listen to the world tell you, you're a slug, you've made mistakes, you can't do this, you can't do that. Listen, if you're born again, get back up on your feet and let God so revolutionize your life that people go like, who are you? Are you the same person I used to run around with? I get that, I get that all the time when I go home. Ron Adam, a preacher. How long have you been a preacher? Ah, <laughs> not that long. Somebody's bound to throw you under the bus. And what they talk about, listen, I know what they mean. And I like to hear that. I'd rather sit around and talk about my change in Jesus Christ than what I did in football or high school or, or <laughs> the things I shouldn't have I did. I said, I'd like to talk. Let me talk about change. Change is everything. Yes, I got some change for that. Come on. <laughs> talk about change all day long rather than all this other stuff. Listen, don't let the, don't let, listen. You've been, listen, you've been foreknown. You've been predestined. You've been, you've been called. You've been justified and you will be glorified. Live it now. Don't wait for tomorrow to come and my life to change. Listen, your life is already in a change. Come out like a butterfly. Come out and f come out into your creative purpose of your rebirth. Don't sit back there and just get beat up by the world. Keep telling you, you never amount to anything. You never be this. Never. Listen, you've already amounted to something if you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You already have 50 things the world can't take from you. The devil would like to get you not to act on them. You got this wonderful war wardrobe of 20 status privileges. You don't even know what the clothes are in your wardrobe. You've never opened the closet. You wonder why your life sucks. Or whatever. Open that closet and see who you really are in Christ and start wearing them garments. I mean, you're an ambassador, you're a priest, you're a chosen one, you've been called. I mean, the only, the only person keeping you down is you. Listen, the Holy Spirit that's inside you is greater than the devil. 
<laughs> First John 4, 4. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You know, you can punch his lights out any day of the week. But he drags you around by the head of the hair. Look what I found. And you just go along with it, stumble along behind him. Forget that. Quit doing that. You don't have, listen, you've been set free. You, Galatians 5, 1 and 13, you've been set free, but here you are a slave. What has happened? You've gone back to the world. Give that up. Christ is much greater. I hear a. What? Uh, that's not the sound I'm supposed to be listening for, but <laughs> if you want to listen for it, it's all right. Here, here's three. Every church age believer gets his resurrection body at the rapture, whether alive or deceased. The passages of interest on that subject matter, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. It's on your paper. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. And 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. These, are, these passages are no doubt what it's talking about. And you know what the key word is when you study this, like in Ephesians? You know what the key word, or in, in uh, Corinthians, you know what the key word is? Changed. Changed. <laughs> changed. We shall be changed. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. That the rapture is not taught until the new covenant. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That's a euphemism for a believer dying. But we shall all be changed. This is another change in your life. This is one at the end of it. This is when it comes and you, you're, you're alive and you receive your resurrection body. You will be changed. And he talks about it in a twinkling of an eye. In uh, verses 52 and 53, the, it talks uh, again. He said, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable and more mortal on mort immortality. Immortal, immortality. In, in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, Paul writes, for indeed in this house we groan. There's our word. And I say, that's a, a word for Paul. He talks about it there. In this house, this earthly house, we groan. We know what he's talking about because we read Romans. We groan longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about your resurrection body. He's talking about your resurrection body. Now, I want you to put your eyes on this verse. So I want you to go to 1 Corinthians. This will revolutionize your, your thinking. 1 Corinthians 15, 37. Now, Paul, in the 15th chapter of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about the resurrection from start to finish. He goes through the most lengthy discussion on the resurrection you could ever hope to hear. In verse 37, he says something relevant to my study. Here's what he says. And, and that which you sow, that's a S-O-W, like sow a seed in the ground. That which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be. Right? Now, if you've ever planted anything, you know that. You put the body... Uh, whatever it is, the acorn or something, you put that body, ac this little round thing, you put it in the ground, cover it up. When it comes up, it's not an acorn. It doesn't look like the acorn you sowed. And you won't know until it gets up there unless you're an expert in that. And it drops acorns, you go like, oh, that's an acorn tree. Now, the point the writer is saying is that the body that is sown, which is what body when you die? What body, what body sown when you die? Your physical body, your corpse, right? That's not what's going to come back. How do I know it? 
He explained it in agricultural terms. Now, a guy like me, I can understand this. I got this down. <laughs> got this one. Now, he uses the whole chapter to go into great links on that. And he, he shares it from so many different angles that you couldn't miss it. So if you never knew that before, it's because you never studied 1 Corinthians 15 before because you can figure that out all by yourself without Ron because he goes over this and over that and over this and over that. Do you understand his principle? Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. You need to know that. So what is this resurrection body going to be? It's going to be a heavenly one. And he's going to tell you that. If you'll take the time to read 15, you'll get all your answers. Your, your mind is going through asking all kinds of questions. They're all answered. He goes into great lengthy detail. Okay? All you got to do is read it. Before you got questions, take your questions to the Lord. Look what he's already told you. And then if you don't have any answers for it, see Al. And go to Al. Okay? He'll, he'll clear you up on it. So we're going to be changed. Now, let's, let's look at 1 Thessalonians because I've just introduced Corinthians to you. So let me introduce you to 1 Thessalonians. Unless I'm in Timothy, so I got to back up. 1 Thessalonians 4, where this great discussion... Verse 13 through 18 goes on about the rapture. Now, that's a Latin word, people. You know, that's a Latin word. <clears throat> we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that is, believers who have died and gone to heaven. You know, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And... When you're there, they call it asleep. For many of us, that would be a wonderful idea, wouldn't it? Just go to sleep. <clears throat> that you may not be, grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. That's believers who have died and gone to be with him. Waiting on the rapture. They're waiting on their rapture and their resurrection bodies. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. Are you with me? What's he talking about? He's talking about getting resurrection bodies. There's an order to it. Those who have gone be ahead of us get theirs first, and then we in a twinkling of an eye. We shall not precede those who have fallen asleep as far as the resurrection body. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Who are the dead in Christ? They're the ones who are in heaven. We will not precede them. They're first. Then we, then we, I don't know, my voice just changed. <laughs> my voice just changed. I feel like I'm 13 years old again. Except his sinuses. So don't jump on I saw a couple of you already all ready to jump on that idea. <clears throat> Let's see. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. We shall be caught up. Oh, wait. The trump will sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud. See, you wonder where all that stuff's going in the cloud. <laughs> you, you computer people. See, we, we, we've been way ahead of you. Uh, 
and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, we're going to be caught up where? Wow. Into a cloud. Now, let's go to Acts and see why he said that that way. I mean, why did he say we're going to be caught up into a cloud? A cumulus, probably a cumulus cloud. Pam thinks it's to meet the Lord. Okay. Pam says she's putting all of her money on that. Uh, Acts one eleven. And they also said, men of Galilee, he's talking about angels. This is a message from the angels. And they said, men of Galilee, or people of doctrinal studies, why do you stand looking into the sky? Well, I know, because that's where Jesus just went. Right? That, I'd be looking up there, too. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's Jesus. This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. He was caught up. See verse 9? And a cloud received him out of their sight. See that in verse 9? Yeah. I'd beat Uber. Huh? Well, I'd beat Uber. Did you tell them you want a pay increase? Oh, I, that's it's good. No. You tell, that tell those Uber people, I want a pay increase because I drive my car. I drive my car. I want a pay increase and pay. <clears throat> um, he, he drives for Uber, in case you didn't know. They know. They know now. I've just told the whole world. But thanks be to God. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. See, they call that victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. There's the victory. Here's another one. Turn your page. No, I guess turn it over. <laughs> turn your page. Yeah, just turn it over. Turn it over. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in a cloud. Listen to this. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. You know, we've, we're always with the Lord, aren't we? I mean, he's never, he never leaves you nor forsakes you. He's got you. He's got you all the way on earth. But you know what? As soon as you die as a believer, he's got you there too. How about that? So why don't you just go ahead and give him all of it now instead, instead of having it all then? I mean, why, why not go all in now? I mean, why do you keep part of this world, play, keep playing with the world, and they keep burning you? Yeah. I'm the smartest guy in the block, but I ain't going to keep bur getting burned and put my hand on it. Right? I mean, at some point, uh, especially when it gets up, I don't have the arm anymore, and I'm up to my elbow. Come on. Now, here's one. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. If, and it's a first-class condition, true. And, and, and listen, he's dealing with debater technique of a false assumption. Like, if we say, if Christ has not been risen and if you read the whole passage you see that people were pre preaching against his death against his burial and against his resurrection which are essential for salvation <coughs> if you read the passage I just reached in and grabbed one if Christ has not risen and that's a true premise then this is also true then your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins <coughs> If the first part of that's true, then the second part of that is true. And you're, listen, now you really are hopeless. And Paul talks a great deal about this in chapter 15. It's a good point. Now, my final point tonight is this. 
our position in Christ. And let me show it to you. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Let me show it to you first. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, that's 2 Corinthians 5. If any man be in Christ, Christ goes to the cross and he dies there for our sins. He's buried and raised from the dead the third day to give you life everlasting. The person who believes that in Romans 1, 16, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. The person who believes that gets saved according to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 by grace, by grace through faith. The gospel, which is the death, burial and resurrection, the gospel is the power of God to save all who believe. The moment you believe, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into union with Christ. Okay? And that's called, if any man be in Christ. If any man be in Christ. And every man who believes the gospel of Jesus Christ in the, under the new covenant of the church age is baptized by the Holy Spirit. That's Galatians 3.27. Galatians 3.27. We are baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. That's the point of salvation. That's one of eight works of the Holy Spirit at salvation because we live in the new covenant church age. You are in Christ. He's, now, here's what Paul says. Paul says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. That is the former way of life. And, and, and behold, all things become new. Listen. You need to ask yourself how much of your life is being lived in the new as opposed to the old. You hear me? Because God saved you, he reached into the old life that you were you were living in the muck and mire of the old life and rescued you Colossians 1:13 and pulled you up out of there and placed you into a position in Christ. And now, behold, you have the possibilities and potential to live out what you already have in the package of grace salvation. There is no reason for you to be in bondage to the old life anymore. But you see, it is a choice. Not that it's not a choice that you don't have a new life. It's a choice that you haven't chose to live it. You understand that? You've been, you were, God reached down through the, through the work of Christ in salvation and rescued you out of that former life to put you into a new one. And he did it by grace. It cost you nothing, still doesn't cost you nothing. My question to you is why aren't you embracing and living that new life when it's all by God's grace and it's by his power and by his might, not yours? Why are you not accessing that? One of the ways you do that is you put yourself in a place to learn this stuff. You put yourself in a position in a church like this where you can sit down and study and learn and understand how to access into that life. Did you not have to learn how to access into the former way of life, a lifestyle? Did you not have to learn it? Listen, I was with a, um, a uh, I guess about 17. He's a senior. I guess that's about what his age is. I thought I was talking to a pharmacist. He knew more about drugs. I, I never heard anybody knew more about drugs than that kid. I mean, <laughs> I said, how did you learn all that? He said, just street. He learned all that out of the street. I went, you sound like a pharmacist. He said, oh, yeah, I know. But it, it's all street stuff. I said, listen, come over here. Come over here. <laughs> Get out of this and come on over here and find what God has for your life. That's not what God intended for you ever to have in your life. And everybody that really loves you has told you that a hundred times. Listen, it's time, time for you to understand that God loves you and he wants you over here. 
wants you on his team. You can't play both of them. You can't play both of them. Time to come home. You know how you start coming home? Start coming to Bible study and let them teach you how to embrace and live out this new life you have. You already have it. You, you, that's not your life. This is your life. This is what Christ died to pull you out of that and to put you over here in a life that you could never imagine. You can never imagine what he has in store for you. So, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians, my passage was, in Christ. Now, let me give you a couple other verses because that's a favorite one, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Let me give you uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In Adam all die, in Christ what? All are alive. Listen, if you're in Adam, you're dead. You'll always be dead. There will never be a t- spiritually. But in Christ, you're alive. You'll always be alive. You'll never be dead. You may think you are. You may act like it, but you're not. Another one is Romans 8.1, another passage on this very subject. In Christ, there is no condemnation. In Christ, there is no condemnation. None. You know why? It's all gone. Now, people may bring it to you. <laughs> yeah, People who judge you may condemn you. But Christ had never condemned you because he died to take you out of the condemnation. Take you out of condemnation and give you pardon. I mean, you can't get better than that. Now, there are three parts of this thing that are important. We call it positional sanctification and theology. But there are three parts to it that's really important. We call it retroactive positional truth. It's called positional sanctification. There are three, there are three categories to it. One is called retroactive positional truth. And, and it's in Galatians, the second chapter, verse 20. And I believe I wrote it on your paper. And listen, let me go ahead. The second one is current positional truth. That's your position in Christ. That's, once you're in Christ, this is your position forever. And here is exper- experiential positional truth experiential position this is the christian life this is living out this is coming over into the the salvation package and learning how to live that passage out to the will of god that that we call it experiential positional truth now i want you to go on your paper look at your paper and with that very you should have that up on the board is on your paper listen to what he says in galatians 2 20 on your paper I have been crucified with Christ. That's a perfect tense in the Greek language. That means that when Christ died on that cross, he died for you when you believed it. You said, Christ died for my sins. I believe it, that I was crucified with Christ. Christ was crucified for me. I was crucified with Christ. Do you understand that? That's a perfect tense. That never changes. All right? That's the starter. We call that retroactive positional truth. I was crucified with Christ is retroactive positional truth. Right? But he died for my sins, not for his. He died for mine. I was crucified with Christ. When I believed it, I, I, I attached my faith to that principle. That he died for my sin. Retroactive position is true. Therefore, it is no longer I who live. Here it is. Down, now I'm down here. It's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. See, that's the transformation. That's what we're after. It's no longer I who live. Listen, your biggest problem in life is I. It's no longer, listen to me, it's no longer I who live. I've got to take the I out and put the what in? Christ, do you understand it? Look at that. Look there on that, on that. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And unless you make that, that's volitional. You must decide who's going to, who you're going to live for. You're going to live for yourself, you're going to live for Christ. 
Christ desires to live your life in you. He wants to live it out in you. We call that, we call that experiential positional truth. It requires studying the Bible. You've got to get to Bible class. You've got to get into a, a rhythm and system, not just to learn it, but to learn it to live it. I'm not interested in just having you come learn it. I want you to be motivated to live it. Live what you learn. There's where the new dynamic, exciting life in Christ is. <clears throat> It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. That Listen, five times he has pushed that subject. Five times he used the word live or life. He repeated that. That's a marker. He repeated it, repeated it, repeated it, repeated it, repeated it. What's he trying to do? He's trying to get, get you to do it. Would you agree with that? He, he wants you to learn it, to live it. He want, I want you to live it, live it. I want you to learn it, to live it. Live it, live it, live it, live it, live it. See, that's what he said. said. I, think, I think I did that five. <laughs> okay, listen. So if you want to live the Christian life, you've got to learn the Word of God. You've got to learn how to do it. Just that simple. You've got to learn how to do it. You, listen, when I got saved, I never took a job nor did anything that interfered with me getting to Bible study. You know why? I was starved to death. And first, I was a new born babe, desired a sincere medical of the Word. Let me tell you, when, when my mother, we used to bake bread all the time. We didn't go to the supermarket. We didn't get to the supermarket. We lived on a farm. There might have been a lot of things that I might have done that I'd go like, well, I think I'll go do such and such. That'd be fun. I put all that aside. When my mother baked bread, I waited till that bread was done. I him hauled around and stuck around and did whatever I could. Here, let me help you dry some dishes. Waiting for that bread to come out because when that bread came out and you reached up there and took a chunk of that off and put some of that homemade butter on it, that was to die for. I mean, at some point, you got you got to make choices. You got to make choices. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. See, we started with it. Look it. You missed it. We started with it, and we came back to it. I was crucified with Christ. And then he goes through this whole discussion. And he comes back at the end and says, who loved me and gave himself for me. See, he came back to it, didn't he? You know what he put in between that learning experience of your salvation? He put live for Christ, live for Christ, live for Christ. Stop living for yourself and feeding your own appetites. Live for Christ because that's where the new life is. That's where you will find why you've been born in the day you've been born and why. <laughs> Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Therefore, if, and this is, if this is true, then the other is true. Therefore, therefore, if then you have been raised up with Christ and you have, that's current positional truth. That's current positional truth. When he says, if then you have been raised up with Christ and you have. See, how do I know that? Because at the point I believed I got baptized, baptized by the Holy Spirit into position in Christ. If then you have been raised up with Christ, current positional truth, keep seeking things above, that's experiential positional truth. That's, 
That's finding my niche in life, in the plan of God, and working it out, making good choices in my life for a change that's compatible with the will of God. Not my will. See, here's me. I'll do it my way. I don't care. Uh Uh-uh. Here's God's way. Not my will, but thy will be done. hoo That's what I say. Keep seeking. That's an imperative. That's a command. Keep seeking things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Here's another. Here's another experiential truth. Set your mind on things above. That's, that's experiential positional truth. Now, how are you going to know what that is unless you show up at Bible study? on some kind of a consistent basis. You start on Tuesday night or Wednesday night and stay with me for a year. Oh, you say, I don't think I could do that. I don't know that I could make that commitment. What are you talking about? It's choices. What do you mean you can't make that kind of a commitment? Suppose you talk that way to the person you're going to marry. Well, I don't know. It may work out. It may not work out. Well, it's not, not, yeah. Huh? That's called shacking up when I was a guy. I don't know what it's called today. Love is what it's called. Uh, my mother would never let me get away with that. She called it what it was. Set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. And so here's your final promise for tonight from God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you, because you're a believer, also be revealed with him in glory. Okay. Let's close in a word of prayer. Just don't live for the resurrection. Just don't li- don't live to just get out of here the best way, the quickest way you can. Enjoy the journey. Smell the roses. Follow the one who created them. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way and studied with us. We know there's a struggle in people's life about what is true and what isn't. It's a journey for each person, but they need to study it. Need to be open to the Holy Spirit to teach them the truth. I just teach the Bible. The Holy Spirit teaches the truth. In fact, one of the one of the titles that the Holy Spirit holds in the church age is the Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit will tell you what is true and what isn't. The scriptures will teach you. They will rebuke you. They will correct you and they will train you in righteousness if you be open to it. To conform you to the image of Christ. To live the good life. And it will even make sense to you. This is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen.